Hey everybody, welcome to the Single Tracks Podcast. My name is Jeff, and today Matt and I are going to be talking about our favorite mountain bikes of 2022, and also we're going to talk about all the bikes that were released in 2022. How are you feeling about the bikes this year, Matt? Yeah, pretty good. I mean, I, you know, it's another year of like new bike releases and everything, and we got on a pretty strong handful and mm-hmm. I mean, they continued to evolve, I think in some ways less meaningful than others, but um, yeah, it seems like the ball is still rolling in the right direction. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I don't know, we've been talking about like every year for the last two or three years is like, Oh, this is a weird year. And I think that's probably a good label for this year as well. Like we're still feeling a lot of the effects of like the supply chain stuff and things getting pushed back and pushed around. And so, yeah, I mean, looking at the bikes I tested this year, it was an unusual year. I tested some, (laughs) some bikes that were kind of out there and ones that, yeah, maybe I wouldn't have tested in a normal year, like given, you know, easier access, but yeah. We did ride some good bikes this year. So what what was your, what were some of your favorites uh, of the bikes that you tested in 2022? So I think I had two favorites and I'll, I'll give a good idea of like all the bikes that I rode first. The first bikes I rode is a little bit later this year, I think until June, so I totally started getting some bikes into review, mm-hmm. but I had the uh, newer second generation Santa Cruz mega tower in, um, and then shortly after the second generation Fazari La Salle Peak. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to a press camp with Pivot and rode their new shuttle e-bikes, uh, long travel, and then the short travel. Uh, we rode the Allied BC40, their new cross-country bike out in Arkansas. Mm-hmm. And lastly, I had the Trek Fuel EX, which was all new for this year too, um, got updated a uh, little longer, a little bigger. If I could pick two favorites, I think... I would pick the Trek Fuel EX and the Allied BC40 that we rode in in Arkansas. Yeah. So what what was it about the the Fuel EX? Had you ridden the Fuel before that? I mean, that bike's been around for a long time, and it's probably one of Trek's best selling mountain bikes. So had you been familiar with it before? Familiar, yes. The last Trek I rode, which is actually kind of funny, it was their I don't know. I don't think it was their first generation of the Remedy, but it was their first generation of the Remedy 29er. And I owned mm-hmm. one of those a couple of years. Uh, it's probably been like five or six years or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I think it was 140, 140. And so at that time, it was kind of like that was like a long travel 29er when they were just figuring out how to put that kind of suspension together with, with 29 inch wheels. But now, funny enough, like the Trek Fuel EX fits that that yeah. travel category because it's a 29 or it's now 140 and then a 150 millimeter fork after the top fuel is it kind of just sunk into like a cross country trail ca- uh, category a little bit a little bit more so yeah yeah it's been a while but um yeah it was good to get on another track and kind of feel what the latest version's like yeah and as i recall but I mean, we, we got that bike, um, pretty close to the launch, but they had to like kind of piece it together with random parts that they were able to find. Was the build that you tested pretty close though to like one of the builds that they have on offer or what, what did you find like with the build on that one? I, so I remember them saying that. And when I wrote the re- review, I was looking and I don't think it's any different than their 9.8 build. Um, all the components were pretty much the same. And so the one thing that was off about it is, you know, like we were talking about uh, supply and inventory, you know, a minute or two ago, that was like the one constraint they had is they, and, and kind of like the one constraint that companies still seem to have is like a limited, it does seem like supply is getting better, but it is still limited in some ways. And so for this one, you know, I would have asked for a medium, but they only had a medium large. And so they sent the medium large. It's great to review either way, but yeah, definitely still a tad too, too big for me. Mm. Yeah. Is that a bike that you could see yourself owning? And w- if you did own it, like, would it kind of take the place of a lot of your bikes? Like, could it be sort of your main bike? Yeah. That's, um, you know, one of the points I was making in the review is that it, it's super impressive. And I guess 
140 is still kind of that. Well, one, it's a sweet spot in that, you know, you can do a lot of things like you can go on a 20, 30 mile ride with it and it's not going to beat you up. Mm -hmm. And then the geometry of it is uh, aggressive enough to where the travel is going to be the only limitation on really like technical trails. But yeah, it, it was really outstanding. And I would definitely buy. It. I think the like takeaway from me was just the ride feel of the bike, in that it had a really stiff frame and a really supple suspension. Yeah, great, great suspension kinematics. And so, just with the two paired together, it's anytime you get like a suspension platform that's laid out really well with mm -hmm. a really stiff frame, it just feels like it picks up speed and carries it so well. Yeah. So yeah, I, I would definitely buy one. And you know, the other kind of factors that go into me and like choosing to say, Hey, this is like a favorite bike is they make a lot of different builds. Um, they make an aluminum version. So it's a little bit more affordable. Yeah. They hit a lot of different marks on it. And of course it's Trek. It's, you know, one of the biggest companies in the world and they have the resources to, to meet all those different points. But, um, yeah, still a great bike. Yeah. Yeah. It, I was definitely nodding along too. When you're saying like 140 millimeters of travel is like, like just the right amount. And I feel like that's going to be sort of a theme for our conversation here is that like in a lot of ways, mountain bikes have, they've started like coalescing around these like key measurements, right? Like, and, and in travel, I think 140 for me too, like that's, that's the right amount. It's not too much, not too little. And yeah, we're seeing that with geometry and everything else with bikes. Um, so yeah. Super interesting. And then you mentioned the Allied BC40, um, which is a bike that we both tested. So we went uh, to Bentonville, Arkansas um, this fall, and we got to check out the BC, uh, sorry, the Allied factory um, and see where they make the bikes. And, and it is a true factory, right? Like, you know, people say like, oh, the, you know, I visited the Santa Cruz factory and, you know, they don't actually make bikes in Santa Cruz, the brand is based there and they assemble bikes and have a big warehouse, but allied, like they're actually making the bikes there. So yeah. What was it about that bike that you, that you really liked? Yeah. So very, uh, different approach to the bike than Trek. Um, and also that like the starting price for those is like seven or 8,000. They're not cheap, Yeah, but gosh, they look so good. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was just that it was it was a different bike than any other. Not in terms that like you know with the Trek it was just such a great ride feel, but the Allied I think it was just so different than anything else I rode mm -hmm. this year and kind yeah. of a unique approach to making the bike. And yeah, as far as being like a 120 120 mil cross country trail bike, it climbed great, you know, on a single pivot suspension layout, climbed great. Mm -hmm super fun to descend on <laughs> and it looked great. Like <laughs> I think that's yeah. a big driving factor. Yeah. Yeah. It was a beautiful bike. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. We had different color schemes like paint jobs. Yours was greenish and mine was purple Green and gold other way around. Yep. Yeah. But like, yeah, they're both beautiful, like great color combinations. They do like such an amazing job on the paint. Like, as I recall, they don't even outsource the paint. I mean, most, brands do that they have like a special paint shop or you know they take it somewhere down the road but allied does it right there they got a paint booth and they do the carbon layup they do it all yeah totally i mean what did you think of the bike compared to other models you rode this year i mean like you said it has a lot going for it for sure it, it looks great super high-end build like very high quality i loved how lightweight it is yes for me i mean i'm still i'll admit i'm a bit of a weight weenie uh, when it comes to bikes sometimes and so yeah it's super fun to ride such a light bike that climbs really well but i find you can actually be a little more playful on lightweight bikes or at least i can um it's just like easier to move them around get them in the air and stuff but like you said the the ride feel is not it's not like your everyday or at least for me it wouldn't be like an everyday kind of bike right like it's not designed necessarily for like comfort and fun i mean it's it's a race bike i think right yeah and so yeah if i were racing and i were like really serious about cross-country riding or marathon riding like just doing 
you know, all day type rides. I think, I think it would be a great bike for me, but yeah, in terms of just being an all around fun bike, I don't, I don't think I would put it in that category. Okay. I thought the, the geometry on it was a, a little bit more relaxed and like a standard cross country bike to where mm-hmm. I think I'd feel comfortable riding on it on regularly on, on certain trails. Like it's definitely because it's so light and mm-hmm. the travel is still rather short. It's definitely not something I would ride on yeah. most of my trails, at least like close by here mm-hmm. outside of Denver. But I think it was comfortable for me enough to ride regularly, just not yeah. on most trails here, <laughs> <laughs> right. but Arkansas for sure. Like the rolling, rolling up and down, like yeah. you don't have like these massive square edge rocks and things like that that are bouncing you around. Yeah. And I will say, I, I do think I'll add that to the positives as well. Like I think the geometry is good and, and that part of it is comfortable. Yeah. It's just more like, it's just a stiff, like race bikes meant to be very efficient. Yeah. For sure. So yeah, it just didn't, it didn't feel, I don't know. Yeah. You and I have different like preferences when it comes to that too. Cause I, I tend to like bikes that are feel a little like, I don't know, couch, like, you know, ones where you can just kind of, mm-hmm. you know, they're going to soak up every little bump and vibration and yeah, you can just, I don't know, just sit back and, and relax a little bit. And that, that's definitely not a bike you can relax on. Yeah. It definitely wants to be pedaled uphill and it, it like it's one of those bikes that really rewards you for for pedal input um like any cross country bike but then also yeah it is so light and stiff that downhill you've kind of got to be on your toes too yeah yeah though it was so fun there was some really good descents in there at the the back 40 trails like unexpected too like where we just kind of roll down and we're like whoa where did that come from that was awesome <laughs> what other bikes kind of stand out to you from this year so yeah, like I mentioned, I had, I had kind of a weird test crop this year. Yeah, maybe maybe didn't do the best job planning. I'll I'll take that part of the blame a little bit, but also yeah, it, I do have a hard time finding test bikes uh, in my size, and so and that actually led to some issues with some of the bikes I actually was able to get. So I tested well the unusual ones that I'm not even including in this ranking. Uh, would be the state clunker, which is, you know, it's a clunker bike. It's a, a rigid, uh, basically just cruiser bike. It's just a fun bike. Um, you know, $500 bike. It's one that you just buy to ride around town and look cool. And then I tested a, a diamondback Honjo gravel bike. Oh, right. So not a mountain bike, but it was, it was good for gravel. Yeah. Had fun on that one. Um, but yeah, not a mountain bike. And then the Elroy. Uh, which Marin calls, I think they call it, maybe I put these words in their mouth, but I think they call it a downhill hardtail. Super slack, a lot of travel, um, more than most hardtails you're going to see. And then, yeah, on our Bentonville trip, we, we rode the Allied BC40, but we also rode Orbea Rise e-bikes, which was good. And then, yeah, I, I just got an Evil the following bike in for test and i've got one ride in on that one uh so far so i don't have a lot to say about that one yet but but that one it first ride was pretty sweet like it's it seems like it's going to be a good one for sure 120 millimeters of travel in the rear so it's you know kind of that down country light travel light duty trail bike um but yeah i really i really like how it, it feels so far but yeah, of those, I would say the the Marin Elroy hardtail was was one of my favorites. Uh, I did enjoy that one. It was kind of weird. Like I wrote I wrote this in my review, but like yeah, at first I was like this bike is really weird. It took some getting used to because it's got I think like a sixty three degree head tube angle, like a super slack one fifty or one sixty millimeter fork. Yeah, really long bike. Uh, steel. And yeah, initially I was like, this bike is rides really weird. And then toward the middle of my testing, I was like, this is the best bike ever. I love this thing. I'm going to buy it. Like it's amazing. And then by the end of it, like, I don't know, like maybe the novelty wore off or I was just like, okay, yeah, it's a good bike. Um, but yeah, not like the best bike I've ever ridden. So yeah, 
that was kind of my experience with that one. And then I also really liked the Orbea Rise. And you and I were on like slightly different models. I think yours was like a aluminum um, and mine was the carbon. And I think that's the like longest I've ridden on a one of these like lightweight ish e bikes. And I really enjoyed it. Like it was it was a perfect bike, I thought, for Slaughter Pen where we rode in Bentonville. Yeah, definitely. Just because there's you know, there's no like sustained descents. And so because of that, like you're constantly just going like up and down, up and down, and you know, there's these like short kind of punchy climbs. And so, yeah, just having an e-bike really saves your legs and you can just ride a lot more and do more downhills on it. And, and yet it still was like super easy to get in the air and really maneuverable. And yeah, I really liked it. Yeah, definitely. I have, uh, well, I wrote an opinion about this, I think maybe last year or something like that, where I've been pretty undecided on short travel e-bikes and like, Hey, what's the point of, you know, it's easy to pedal this like big enduro bike up um, with a motor anyway, but mm -hmm. definitely you go to a place like Arkansas and you kind of see, Oh yeah. Like this makes sense. If, if you're after an e-bike, you know, something like that, where the pivot shuttle SL kind of like their lightweight e-bike mm -hmm. makes a lot more sense there. Yeah. I was surprised. I, I was of the same opinion. I would argue it like strongly that like e-bikes only makes sense for like a long travel, you know, heavy one, big battery, mm -hmm. big motor, basically. You know, I looked at them as these like kind of self shuttle vehicles where you could you go up a really big mountain and then bomb back down it. But yeah, riding the Orbea in Bentonville really changed my opinion because it was like, yeah, I mean, I felt, I felt like I could ride all day on it and it was just all fun. Like there was no parts that I'm like, okay, get this over with. All of it was just like, sweet, let's go up again. Yeah, it makes it a lot easier to carry your speed. Mm, yeah. Pretty much everywhere. Uphill, downhill. Yeah. You just you kind of maintain a it's not like an enduro bike where you're just like trotting along uphill and then <laughs> you know, speeding downhill. Yeah. More consistent pace. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Any anything else about the bikes you rode last year? The had you had been on the Mega Tower, the first version of the Mega Tower, right? Yeah, right. I, we should talk about that just because it's been such a, a popular bike yeah. this year. I mean, most Santa Cruz's are, but it seemed like the Mega Tower got a lot of interest. Yeah, it was an awesome bike. It definitely much different than the first version. I think Santa Cruz kind of made uh, an early long travel 29er with the first version that was like still sort of an all mountain bike. And now it's for sure an enduro bike. Mm. Great bike. They are still very expensive <laughs> and I still believe like people, people love the Santa Cruz brand and they're going to pay for that brand name. But yeah, the climbing, I don't, I wasn't like terribly impressed with. I, th I thought the C2 bang was still a bit reserved for, mm. you know, I mean, a, an enduro bike. I think it's only like 76 or just a bit over maybe 76 and a half, which is, oh, yeah. you know, I found myself on, on steep climbs still getting on the nose of the saddle quite a bit. And, mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, I mean, it's still just a bear of a bike to climb with. I ragged on it uh, initially because it came with a 30 tooth chain ring. And I was like, come on, you have like this big 52 tooth uh, granny gear on here. But it was uh, it was presumptive. I still <laughs> needed the 30 well, tooth because good, it's good thing. it's a lot of bike to climb with. But descending, I, you know, to be honest, it was such a fun bike to descend. Mm. The VPP on it feels amazing, really stiff really, really comfortable bike to descend on. Um, it carries its speed very, very well. Yeah. So, I mean, Santa Cruz, while we're talking about the brand, they seem like this year, they kind of like knocked out a bunch of new releases and it seems like yeah. they got rid of a lot of the like 27.5 bikes became 29ers or became mullets. And then we also saw a lot of updates from Yeti as well. They completely redid their line with the SB 120, 140, 160. I mean, it was like literally like one week it was one bike and then the next week yeah. it was another bike. <laughs> right. And then Ibis too was another brand that kind of did that. For them, it seemed like a big driver was this like rebranding uh, where they, they got kind of like a new logo and a new aesthetic that they're going for. But yeah, what do you think, what do you think was driving like some of these 
big updates where like all the bikes got changes and, and new things rolled out? Well, I think a big part of it is just the product cycle, like the mountain bike product cycle. I mean, if you look at like Santa Cruz, they consistently update their bikes every three years. It's like on the, on the money. And yeah, I remember shooting a question over to their marketing representative or brand representative and just saying, Hey, like, you know, a lot, cause a lot of the updates I think were pretty minimal for Santa Cruz. The geometry changes on a couple of the models were pretty negligible um, mm-hmm. in that, you know, the head tube angle is like almost the exact same. The C tube angle is almost the exact same. Yeah. And then the, as far as the suspension kinematics, it was like for the past couple of years, brands have been giving their bikes more and more anti-squat for better pedaling mm-hmm. characteristics. And now they're like, Hey, we, you know, it's sort of like bottom brackets. They found a point where it just wasn't good anymore. Mm. And so started dialing back their anti-squat and for a brand like Santa Cruz um, and Yeti, I, I believe also, and, and I mean, pretty much any brand, I think it's really just driven by a product cycle. You know, you want to mm. keep those bikes in the news. You want to give updates so that consumers aren't forgetting about you. Where it came with Santa Cruz, it was, it seemed, they seemed heavy on frame feature updates, like mm. adding down tube storage. Um, and I, I think that's kind of going to be a, a big thing for a lot of the other brands too, is just adding frame features, down tube storage, flip chips. Uh, yeah. Gosh. Cable routing. They're going to, they're going to be adding all this yeah, head tube. We saw a few of those this year. It's like, that's a feature nobody wanted. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, for Yeti, it was again, just kind of like a sweeping product um, update because it'd been a couple of years since they introduced the, SB100, the 115, the 130, the 140, the 150. Yeah, I, it kind of makes sense because they were hold out. Yeah, it does seem like, again, we were talking about everything kind of like coalescing around a few like standard measurements. And yeah, it's like light duty trail bike, 120 millimeters. And Yeti's got one now. They had a one, 100 and a 115 Um, but so yeah, now they got a 120 and then, yeah, you're more like solidly trail bike creeping into all mountain is 140 and then yeah, 160 people tend to associate with enduro. So yeah, it's almost like they're just kind of trying to align it with like what everybody's come to accept as being like the right, right measurements. Totally. Yeah. It's kind of funny what Yeti has done with, you know, because they had the hundred, the SP 100, the 115. And I, I wonder if they kind of got to a point where it was like, well, does anybody really want a hundred mil Yeti? Like do people that buy Yetis really care about like <laughs> yeah. XC hundred mil race bikes? Um, and then the 115 was just the geometry on it was so, it was like dated by the time it came out, you know, it was so reserved. Yeah. And then if you look at how well brands have done with the 120, 130 trail bikes, like the Ivis Ripley AF, the transition spur evils following who else, mm-hmm. uh, the Rocky mountain element. It was kind of like, Oh yeah, of course, like we need this 120 mil right. sort of down country, whatever you want to call it, um, mm-hmm. bike in our lineup. Yeah. I, it's, I, th- I think, uh, the product cycle speak to that a lot and just kind of aligning your, your models with the latest trends. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the ones too, you know, evil updated, I, I'm doing air quotes here right now. Uh, updated all of their bikes, I believe, it did like what they called a LS version or lightly salted. And because admittedly they weren't huge updates, but one of the biggest aspects of that was adding the universal derailleur hanger to their frames. And it seems like, you know, it's sort of like when Boost came out, uh, when SRAM, you know, said this is like standard we're going with going forward. And we saw like, bunch of frames get updated because everybody nobody wanted to be sort of left behind on that and it seems like universal derailleur hanger another SRAM standard uh, is kind of doing the same thing like I, I don't know it definitely gave a lot of brands like an excuse to look at their their models and say hey we, we could do like a minor update so we can get UDH on there totally yeah I mean that was kind of the when Ibis updated their updated air quotes uh their bikes mm-hmm. this year was basically around new branding mm-hmm. and uh and the stream edh like those were the only two things and so yeah they had a big sale on a lot of their bikes right before 
the update and mm -hmm. it definitely made me curious. I ended up buying a Ripley AF frame, the older branded version, mm -hmm. because it was a crazy sale. And then, uh, you know, like, well, they're probably not going to update this bike just yet because it hasn't been that long. Yeah. And then, yeah, come to find out it's, well, it's basically just, it's new branding. And then they added this Ram UDH um, yeah. capability. Yeah. Which is a great thing too. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, a lot of mountain bikers like to complain about new standards and yeah, we hate, hate the, the thought that like, oh, we're going to have to upgrade our stuff. We're going to be forced to upgrade or like, I've got all these, I've invested all this money in wheels or you know, drivetrain stuff. And now there's a new mm -hmm. thing that my stuff's not going to work with. But yeah, I mean, I think, I feel like we all need to admit that derailleur hangers were, have been dumb for a long time, <laughs> like finding the right <laughs> one for your frame. And like, yeah, I, it's a pain. I paid $90 for a derailleur hanger once for a bike because, you know, nobody else had it. It was like, and, and I had right. to wait weeks because I could only find one in the UK. And, you know, this just, it's, it was ridiculous, especially for a part that's designed to fail. You know, it's like almost a, right. a consumable part. And yet <laughs> they were so hard yeah. to get. Um, so yeah, it's a welcome change, but it, it does, it's going to take a while for that transition. And yeah, it is going to be frustrating for those of us that have bikes that don't work with UDH yet. Um, but yeah, we'll get through it just like we get through <laughs> all the other changes. <laughs> right. Yeah, it definitely does seem like a, a smart update. Um, same thing. I spent 50 bucks on a, a piece of, uh, I guess, billet aluminum mm -hmm. to take with me on the trip to South America. Just, you know, just in case I break a hanger, which I've never done in my life, but just in case <laughs> I break yeah. a hanger, uh, I've got this special one that only one other brand aside from the manufacturer makes. <laughs> right. Sounds like a scam. I don't know. <laughs> you should do an investigation. Like there, there's must be some reason why it's been that way, but yeah. Right. So also, you know, I kind of mentioned it in the beginning, but you know, this year in some ways felt like a lost year for updates, uh, perhaps due to supply chain problems. So, you know, updates that, that brands had planned to do, they realized they weren't going to get the bikes in time or, you know, they're just waiting for like previous model year bikes to actually like arrive um, in their showrooms. And so, yeah, it feels a little bit like a gap year, but there were a few major updates and, and new bikes from brands. Um, the Pivot Shadow Cat comes to mind. That's a all new bike from Pivot. Uh, we also got the, the Trek Fuel EX. Um, which was a big update, a lot of changes on that one. The Scott Genius as well got the mm. a really new look and, and feel to that bike. Were there any like major updates that, that stood out to you or, or like long overdue updates to bikes you're glad to see? Yeah, hard to say. I, I think like we were talking about the Yeti update made a lot of sense um and just you know keeping with the times the shadow cat was interesting because that's you know a 27.5 bike front and rear and pivot mm -hmm. is that the only 27.5 bike they have in their line now it seems like it yeah yeah i mean their uh pivots brand is totally geared toward like high-end like business oriented bikes and stuff like that um not necessarily the novelty edition of fun that we think of but <laughs> yeah not that their bikes are their bikes are a ton of fun, but in that like, you know, they're making serious, serious bikes that are, are mm -hmm. fun is not like the big underlined word when right. when you read their marketing. <laughs> and then the Santa Cruz updates I thought were interesting too, and in that Bronson and fifty ten are mullets now. And um after spending so much time on trying to hold on to twenty seven point five wheels, they've been like, All right, well, <laughs> this is the new twenty seven point five mullet. So Yeah. Yeah, I thought those were interesting updates for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really like the Scott Genius. So that's one that I want to test anyway, because it is so unusual and, and different. You know, they, I guess they bought Bold Cycles or they're like very close partners with them and Bold kind of pioneered this design where the shock is like tucked up inside, not inside, not completely inside, but it's like tucked under the carbon frame where you can't, can't really see it, um, which is, you know, a lot of ways it's a great idea because it protects it, keeps like dirt and stuff from getting in and, and wearing out your seals and stuff. 
and it's super low like the shock positioning is super low like so i it looks like a cool bike that i'd love to test and, and see how it rides and then of course since the shock is hidden on it they also got to hide all the cables and so that part i'm not sure like i'm on board with i mean the, i guess it's a it is a good clean look but yeah i would hate to have to work on that bike or you know especially for us because we're always testing like different components you know to like throw a new set of brakes on that bike it's probably probably an ordeal yeah i think uh that the look of the new scots similar to the cannondale jekyll where that shock is really tucked underneath and then along the lines of more and more electronic drivetrains and stuff yeah just cleaner looking bikes in general i think is going to be a big driving factor for bikes in the future mm -hmm. but those do look really really cool and sleek yeah and i think like when we talk about Hey, geometry is slowing down. All these other things, suspension and kinematics are slowing down. And then you look at the new Scott, there's obviously still a lot of room for development in mountain bikes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's funny too. Cause you're right. The easiest solution to like hiding cables, making them look cleaner is go electronic, um, which a lot of bikes have done. The evil that's in for test right now has SRAM access wireless shifting on it, which is great. But the frame still has like all the holes and ports and things for cables, but they're empty now. So now you're like, that looks worse than if it just <laughs> yeah had cables. So I don't know. Yeah, we're in a weird like transition period where I don't know. I wonder if we'll see bikes that are designed purely for wireless systems and like they don't even have any ports at all. I mean, obviously brakes like. It's going to be a long time before those are wireless, but yeah, it's, it's, we're in a weird in-between time. Totally. I have seen some brands just adding little rubber filler yeah. grommet things to plug up those cable routing <laughs> holes. Yeah. You got a bunch of weird rubber circles on your bike. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, but it's more than that. You know, like these, it has to, like the frame has to have a little, there's like a square little box where the circle exits out and like it's obvious what that is and it's like dude is your bike missing something like <laughs> right yeah yeah uh, i was talking with a friend um this past weekend on a ride about sram access because the stuff is on sale and mm -hmm. yeah i'm not sure what your pin opinion on it has been the it definitely feels quicker than a mechanical mm -hmm. gx access system it feels slightly quicker to shift but other than that, I, I mean, I guess you have cable maintenance that you don't really have to do. It, indexing might be a little bit easier, but mm -hmm. still there is not a big performance gain when you go to an electronic drivetrain, mm -hmm. at least in my opinion. And so the big draw to it, I guess, is just reducing the amount of cables you have on your bike. And yeah. it, admittedly, it does look really, really nice getting rid of I mean, at this point, you're only getting rid of one cable, but, uh, <laughs> right. You're on your way. Well, too, if you invest $700 or $800 get a in the dropper. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, you're getting rid of cables, but you're adding batteries. So, you know, it's a trade off. <laughs> yep. Definitely. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, related to kind of this whole, uh, discussion about the supply chains and like bikes being updated or not being updated lately. You know, we're at a point now where there are too many bikes, like a lot of brands have a lot of bikes and it's crazy to think that that was just earlier this year that most of us were still in the mode of like, oh, you know, bikes are hard to get, parts are hard to get. Mm -hmm. You actually wrote a story, I think it was in March of this year, so not that long ago, sort of saying that the bike boom was over and... That was one of our most popular articles of the year, I think, because at the time people were like, hold on, like I, I haven't heard this. Like, yeah, I thought this was going to go on forever. Or like people were saying, oh, you know, our bike deliveries are out two or three years. You know, we thought we'd be going into like 2024, 2025, still waiting for bikes. And yet here we are. And there's so many bike sales. It, it's been kind of nutty, the amount of sales lately yeah and i don't know maybe i'm just plugged in i'm signed up for way too many newsletters <laughs> but it has been nutty uh the amount of sales that there have been like on strand products and, and then just bikes in general so many sales lately yeah 
it's yeah, if you're able to take advantage of it or hold off until, I mean, I think I'm going to look up or look at updating my bike in the fall from, from now on, whenever I'm ready to update. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, so many sales. And the funny thing is that's how specialized framed it on some of their big sales is that, oops, we made too many bikes. Yeah. Yeah. That was literally the name of the sale that specialized had was we made too many. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it is kind of like this whiplash effect that brands unfortunately are facing to where they had so much demand and then they're producing a lot more bikes, making a lot more bikes to fill the demand. And then mm-hmm. yeah, the supply chain issues where it takes forever for bikes to get over here. And then, um, yeah, I mean, it, I think consumers also got tired of it, at least like speaking with bike dealers, they're like, Hey, you know what? I'm either just not interested in buying a bike anymore, or I found a different bike, mm. uh, maybe on the used market. Yeah. And if you're a bike dealer, you might be kind of stuck with all those bikes that you ordered thinking that there would still be demand for it when, when this time came. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to, to someone, uh, at one of the big component brands and they, you know, they were saying like, they, they were shocked that all these bike companies didn't foresee the end of this boom, right? Like, you know, I think a lot of companies went into it really optimistic that like, you know, this demand is here to stay. Like people are going to try biking. They're going to love it. And they're going to like, just keep buying more bikes. And, you know, we've got so many orders, like we can never catch up. And sure enough, you know, they caught up and we're, I mean, we're seeing that in other industries as well, like tech for those who follow that, you know, a lot of those companies overhired when everybody was jumping onto Zoom calls and, you know, doing virtual schooling and that kind of thing. And then come to find out that was, that was temporary. That's not what everybody wants to do. So, but it's interesting because it seems like some of the smaller brands may have fared better, or at least, you know, are seeing like more even uh, sort of demand for their products. And we saw new bikes from, I made a list of a few of the ones we covered, like Kodic, uh, Nikolai, Esker, Ionic, Starling. A lot of these names, you know, a lot of folks maybe have never heard of, but these are cool, like boutique brands. A lot of them are, you know, hand built bikes. And so it seems like they're, they're able to pump out some updates this year, um, more updates than some of the other brands. And yeah, I was looking at a bike, I forget which one from one of these brands. I was thinking that would be a cool bike to buy, but they're not having sales because <laughs> they're, they're like, no, like we have exactly the right number of bikes that we need. And so, right. yeah, it, it is interesting to see like that dichotomy between the big brands and the small brands right now. Yeah, totally. And those those big brands really had an advantage early on in the pandemic, just mm. sheer amount of buying power they had and um, the amount of uh, factory space they could buy up and produce more bikes to yeah. try and accommodate the demand. So yeah, it's uh, that article was kind of like bold to write. Uh, at least the headline was that early on. And then if you, at, at that time, if you had heard what the bike dealers were saying that, you know, people aren't really busting down the doors for, these entry level bikes, um, anymore, mm-hmm. there's still a, probably a growing demand for mountain biking as it continues to get bigger, but the bike boom itself where everybody wanted a bike is, is come and gone. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I mean, I think some people will be happy with that. <laughs> right. Yeah, for sure. I, I do think we're going to continue to be in sort of a growth phase, but yeah, maybe just not at the levels that, <laughs> that we had hoped for. Right. You know, I mean, I don't know, maybe there were 50% more people on bikes couple of years ago and you know maybe it's going to level out at like 10 percent. like not all of them are going to stick with it yeah um, but some of them will and so that is a good thing long term but yeah some of those some of those brands that kind of used their size to their advantage and said hey we're going to buy up as much factory time as we can it's kind of come back to bite some of them um and so yeah we'll see It'll be interesting yeah so we talked about a few e-bikes uh, in the mix here as well, about bikes we tested and new bikes that came out this year. And yeah, I noticed there were there was a fair number of e-bike announcements from brands that haven't had e-bikes in the past, like Transition, um, Evil as well. And then just today, Scott has a new like super lightweight e-bike called the scott lumen which at first i saw that headline and was like oh they're making a bike light but uh 
Yeah, it's a bicycle. So, yeah. What do you what do you think about the e-bikes that we're seeing this year? Well, yeah, like you'd mentioned the holdouts, I mean, gosh, are there any more? Yeah, I don't know, probably. Probably these yeah, the Very, hand-built guys I mentioned earlier. All the, yeah. All the guys making steel and titanium bikes, they don't they don't have them, but everybody else does. Right, the like only small to medium size uh companies that I can think of that aren't making one are um like Gorilla Gravity in Denver for example but they kind of have a unique setup with their frame production um so it makes sense that they're not really doing one yet but yeah transition released one and then told people they were releasing another one next year um mm-hmm. and then Evil came out with one finally which oh and uh, Ibis Ibis came out with one wow. Yeah. Um, that was their first e-bike, the, uh, Oso, right? Okay. Right. Yeah. Not to be confused with the Diamondback fat bike. Yeah. <laughs> so, geez, I think all the core mountain bike brands have, are making e-bikes now. Yeah. Yeah. And they seem to be kind of coalescing around, yeah, this idea of like the longer travel, like kind of self shuttling bikes and then the lighter weight e-bikes so yeah we saw kind of a mix of that and you know for brands like transition and evil that are tend to be a little more progressive and and skew toward the gravity end like that's what they're starting with is those bigger e-bikes but then yeah you've got brands like pivot like you said more of like a race heritage more like serious bike kind of angle that they're taking to things and so yeah they have their lightweight one and scott too as well with you know their racing focus you're seeing more of those like shorter travel lighter weight e-bikes yeah totally the one that transition hasn't released yet i can't remember if it's i think it might be the relay if it's the repeater they already released but marketed as sort of this two-in-one bike and that you can take out the battery and no oh, it's as light as uh, mm-hmm. a regular mountain bike and you can pedal it like that yeah which is kind of like a underlying piece for the pivot shuttle SL2 and that it's light enough to, you can pedal it like a, a regular mountain bike too. I don't know how big of a selling point that will be uh, because it's still a really heavy yeah. mountain bike. If you're, I mean, if the travel is only 132 or 135 for the pivot, you know, you're still pedaling around a 40, 42 pound, mm-hmm. 130 mil travel bike. Yeah. And same with the transition. Like, I don't think people are buying their bikes. Like, it's, um, you know, a two in one oven or something like that. And then it can do <laughs> right. this, you know, it's the same amount of space in your kitchen or garage. Uh, and it has two <laughs> features because it just doesn't really translate the same. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, it looks odd too, to be like pedaling around, like part of your frame is missing. And <laughs> yeah, f- from some of the interviews I've done this year about various topics, like that comes up that, you know, somebody will say like, oh, you know, actually, a lot of us could benefit from like a longer stem, let's say, but then they'll caveat that and say like, but it would look weird. And so nobody does it. And so, yeah, like aesthetics is actually a big part of that. And so, yeah, I don't see people doing that from a practical or from just a like looking cool standpoint, taking their batteries out. I mean, really, you can do this with any bike. I'm pretty sure. Like mm-hmm. I, I tested some e-bikes and tried riding them, you know, pop the battery out, rode them around just to see how they would feel. So this isn't like, I don't maybe they've done some additional like structural things that like make that possible. But for the most part, you can do that. But I don't think anybody really wants to. Yeah, it would. I mean, I would just have an e-bike to have an e-bike on top of my non <laughs> right. motorized unless, bikes. Unless you're like, oh, well, I could take it to that place that doesn't allow e-bikes and I'll just take my battery out and I'll be good. Right. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, how many people are going to do that? Right. (laughs) Exactly. So let's talk about predictions for next year, 2023. What do you you think we're going to see um, continue or like maybe, maybe new stuff popping up? Yeah, I think geometry is still going to slow down um, quite a bit. I really do think we're like hitting a point of diminishing returns there. Mm Mm-hmm. There's still going to be, I think, big changes for brands that have a longer product cycle and say they haven't updated their bike in like four or maybe five years or something mm-hmm. like that. Like there's still a lot of room to change up the uh, geometry. But if you've updated in the past year or two, like I don't think geometry is going to be the big 
reason to update your bike anymore. Mm -hmm. Maybe suspension kinematics, but I do think like frame features, adding more electronics will be kind of driving forces for bike updates. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and I'm I'm thinking of, you know, Sam James, one of our freelance contributors, uh, recently wrote a piece about one by drivetrains and like how that had such a ripple effect on geometry and components and everything like that. And yeah, we haven't had like anything else like that, right? That's like driving these geometry changes. Like for in a lot of ways, a lot of these changes drop I would throw dropper posts in there as well either allowed or drove some of the geometry changes that we saw over the last five to 10 years. But yeah, all that seems to have been kind of worked out now. And unless we see something else like dropper posts or, you know, one by drivetrains, like, I don't, I don't know that there's going to be a reason, like you said, to, to really mess with things because kind of, kind of figured out what works. Yeah, totally. Right. I, I think that, there are, there's still a lot of room for component updates. Like people, more brands are using shorter crank sets this year mm. yeah, and bigger diameter dropper posts. But I mean, the really minor tweaks are, and again, those are, you can kind of call like shorter crank sets a, a slight performance gain. Um, mm -hmm. But I think things like that, smaller updates that are a little bit less noticeable will continue to catch on. And for some reason, like flip chips are still big. Mm -hmm. I don't, yeah, I still don't really understand them, but <laughs> yeah, like with the track fuel EX, there's like six different geometry configurations on the bike. And yeah. It's like, why not just make one that <laughs> is best? Right. Yeah. It's confusing for sure. Like for us writing about them, but you know, and, and we look at this stuff like every day and professionally and it's confusing to us. And I can't imagine for a consumer, you know, I'm sure like, you, you think, well, okay, that's cool. I can adjust it. Like if I'm not happy with it, but in reality, like nobody touches those things for the most part. Maybe they do. We should do a survey, ask people, like, if you have a flip chip, like, have you ever flipped it? <laughs> Cause I heard, I overheard a guy on a group ride recently, uh, talking about his bike and, you know, he's like, oh yeah, it's got the flip chip and, you know, I could put it in the lower mode or higher mode or whatever, but I haven't tried that yet. I've had the bike like three years or whatever. And it's like, okay. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, but yeah, but he still was talking about it as if it was like, Oh, this is a great thing to have, even though like I don't actually need it. So, um, yeah. I, I mean, maybe I should, uh, but I've never really gotten comments on it either. It's whenever I get a bike in that has a flip chip, I always leave it in the stock setting, the mm -hmm. neutral setting, whatever it is, because, it has always felt best in that way. Yeah. And I think brands have gotten better to where you can separate the geometry from the kinematics or maybe they're, you know, there are brands like the Trek fuel or some of the Yetis and stuff now where you have two different flip chips, you have one for your suspension, one for your geometry so that mm -hmm. it's separate, but there have been bikes in the past, like Rocky mountain still does their bikes this way. I believe to where you're adjusting your geometry, but it is at one of the shock links also. So it affects the suspension kinematics mm. and yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's, it's any bike that I've had with a flip chip, it always feels best in the stock setting. Um, yeah. And you can adjust it and it's like, ah, uh, yeah, okay. It's maybe the head tube angle is a little bit steeper, but still feels better in, in mm. that stock setting. So, yeah, that's not to say, I think it's a great thing. It's a great thing to have for the brands to do if it's, to allow them to, you know, if you want to ride different wheel size on the bike, then having the ability to do that, like to flip it in conjunction with like changing something about the components or the suspension travel. Like if you swap out the shock, you know, for a longer or shorter one, I think then that's great. If you can just flip a chip and use your same bike and not have to like get a whole new bike. But yeah, like in terms of just it's, everything's the same, but you flip the chip like that doesn't seem like many people get a lot of use out of that. Right. Exactly. But yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if they'll go anywhere. Um, <laughs> it kind of seems like yeah, having those features is like a big selling point for people and saying, Hey, yeah, you get this one bike, but it can also, like, you can have it with this head angle or that head angle, or it can go in this shock setting or that shock setting. Like I think it negates the concern of being 
stuck to one bike when you buy a bike, if you're a consumer and then yeah. like yeah. most people are looking at several different bikes and it takes a lot to narrow it down to one. Mm-hmm. And then if you narrow it down to one, you're like, Oh, I still have all these settings though. So I can make right. it exactly how I want. Right. And yeah, it probably doesn't add much to the cost of the bike either. Right. It's just like a little bit of hardware and right. You know, on the design end, they just make sure to leave some room for the flip chip to flip around. So yeah, yeah, probably not a bad thing. So other stuff as well. Yeah. You mentioned the, the larger seat tube diameters and that's a trend. I think you actually wrote about that trend last year, 2021. We're starting to see more of that. It was, uh, I think it came out early this year, like January yeah. of 2022. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 So the, the fatter seat tubes allowing for longer travel dropper posts, which I think most people are into. So yeah, that's, that seems like a good change. Yeah, totally. Uh, there are a few brands that moved to 34.9 this year. Norco, um, tracked it with their fuel EX. <laughs> There were a couple other, I can't remember them. And and then, you know, some brands who are still like holding on to 31.6 or Mm 30.9 and that, yeah, for a reason, they don't see any merit updating, but yeah, at least like the folks that I talked to about 34.9 seem to believe that it, again, it's not a performance update. It's just something that I think mitigates concern for consumers about the product or the life of, of a certain product, like the dropper post. Yeah. Yeah, you're sort of sort of future proofing because, I mean, right now, the dropper posts that are on the market, they still skew toward the 30.9 and 31.6. Uh, like you're, you don't have as much selection currently at the 34.9 end. But yeah, I'm sure we're going to start to see those move that way. But um, yeah, it'll probably take a, a long time. This is one of those where the frame manufacturers are out actually out ahead of the component suppliers, which it doesn't always happen that way. Yeah. And a lot of this talk has been driven by uh, bike yoke. Like they've been talking about it for years um, with geometry changing on bikes and, and they're trying to keep up with the pace of geometry change and brands asking for longer and longer droppers. And they're saying, Hey, like we can't really make, a good enough product at the length and the existing diameters that you're looking for. So, right. Yeah. But I, you know, I've talked to other people who just didn't feel like it was that big of a deal or they're not really seeing concerns about the, uh, or warranty issues on 30.9 and 31.6 that could be associated with like longer dropper posts. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah, other features that we talked about, uh, the frame storage, um, we're seeing more brands adopting that, you know, specialized, I think was the first like major brand to do that. Maybe the first overall, um, with their SWAT storage system. Um, but now Trek's got it. Santa Cruz has it. I don't know. Am I missing anybody? Or Bea started working it into, uh, some of their frames. Yeah, I think with it becoming like so much more ubiquitous that you're going to see people who buy a bike because it does have that feature or discount a bike because it doesn't, Mm. you know, I mean, it's a, if you can work around like the existing patents and whatnot, if they are still active with specialized, I'm guessing in theirs, it is still active, Mm -hmm. but obviously there's ways that other brands are working around that to add it in, then it's a, it's a pretty good selling point for your bike. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you find it super helpful? Um, do you use frame storage a lot? Is that something you would look for? Like when you buy a bike? So the bikes that I own, they don't have them. Mm. And I've had a couple of bikes that have had them for review, like the Santa Cruz and then, um, the Trek, but, uh, on review bikes and stuff, it's like, I really don't settle into them that much. So I'm not really like putting my gear into, but I, I would definitely would use them. I think it's like, I mean, the problem that I have bouncing around different bikes and stuff like that is it's hard to keep track of like a toolkit here and toolkit there. But, um, yeah. And then I, I think the other thing, like, man, I hate using those tube strap things with tools and everything there's never a good space in the frame for it right yeah you got to put all your stuff together 
so it doesn't bounce around, rattle inside your frame. Right, exactly. Scratches up the paint. You know, I think that's like, it, and then you're just putting like this big black like Velcro thing on your four thousand dollar frame, and it's like, mm-hmm. God, that's ugly. <laughs> so I definitely, I understand. Like, I think if I owned a, a a bike that had that feature, I would definitely use it just to keep that stuff tucked away um, and just know it's always there. Yeah, it, it does seem like a nice feature to have. Yeah, it, to me, it's great, but it's like doesn't quite go far enough you know i mean those tubes are big like down tubes are are big on carbon bikes and we should mention i think some aluminum bikes are starting to have the in-frame storage but yeah i don't for me i think i still would need to carry some kind of pack like a hip pack or you know what i've gotten into lately is just little frame bags or even bar bags or things like that yeah i agree they don't look good and Most of them bounce around and feel awkward because you're putting weight like on parts of the bike that shouldn't have weight. And yeah, but I'm definitely all for anything you can do to store more stuff on a bike. And so, yeah, especially for summer rides, seems like you get everything you need into one of those and ride without a pack. Just for me, it just feels so much better to ride without anything, even a hip pack. Yeah, feels feels good to get rid of that. The cool thing about specialized is that they include like a a bladder basically like you, mm-hmm. and it's shaped like the down tube so you can fill it up with water and have like an extra water source on your bike. Yeah. Yeah, super cool. A lot of thought goes into that for sure. And then yeah, I think one more trend that we're seeing and have been commenting on uh with bike releases this year is proportional chain stays. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, in the past most bikes they would you know, bike designers would pick like one chainstay length and run it across all sizes for a model. I think in part just because it made manufacturing easier, they could do like a, you know, kind of the same rear triangle for all the bikes and, you know, saved them some time and expense. But obviously riders were all different sizes. And so that, that doesn't necessarily work. There's, there's some compromises there. And so starting to see that more. Like what, what do you think's driving that? Why are we seeing that? Is it just, is it just time? Yeah, I think time's probably a good, a good word for it. And another way it's like optimize bikes for like, across your size range. Mm-hmm. Taller people, I think this is, it's always been like at the expense of taller people because I would assume like clothing, uh, that mm. geometry is often designed around the middle of the bell curve, which is, it's awesome for me as like somebody who's five, eight and always a medium, everything, Mm -hmm. because that's where you do notice like on some of these bikes with proportional chain stays, like they're around the same for the size mediums. And then they change uh, for taller sizes, Mm -hmm. obviously. But yeah, I think it's just another way to optimize your bike. And as reach has gotten so much longer, people now notice it and, and C2 angles have gotten so much steeper. It's like you, do notice having chain stays that are, are far too short mm-hmm. and that you feel way too stretched out or uncentered across the bike. Yeah. Um, way too forward, uh, far too forward anyway. And, um, uncentered. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Chain stays. I mean, like a lot of things on mountain bikes, it's like longer ones. People will say, Oh, a longer chain stay. I mean, that makes it more stable. And you think, wow, that's great. Yeah. I want a more stable bike. And then they say, well, if you have a shorter one, it's more playful. And you think, well, yeah, that sounds good too. And so like over the (laughs) years, we've, we've bounced between those. Like everybody was trying to make theirs really short so that they could, you know, add the word playful into their marketing copy. And, and then, you know, Enduro was big. And so people were like, oh, no, no, like we made ours longer so that it's more stable and you can go faster. And so, yeah, like it is one of those. Based on that, there must be some Goldilocks thing in between, right? That's like Mm -hmm. playful and it's stable. And so, yeah, but you can't do that for everybody if you're giving them all the same size, every sized rider. So, yeah, that that's a welcome change for sure. And I'm curious, it might be worth us diving into, like, what changed to allow that? Like, was it just, you know, bike companies are saying, screw it, like, it's going to cost us more but this is really important. We need to do it. Or 
did something change in terms of like the manufacturing that just made it like more cost uh, effective now where they're like, we can, we can do this and it's not going to affect our bottom line. Um, because I know like with carbon fiber, you know, a big part of the cost is in creating these molds. And so right. if you only have to make one mold, that's a lot cheaper than having to make five, you know, like one for each size. So yeah, either way, I feel like we're coming out ahead, which is always good. Yeah. The interesting thing about this is that they're still able to make the brands that I've talked to are the rear triangle uh, is actually the same ah. measurement across all sizes still. It's just they're lengthening the chain stays where or on the front triangle where it connects to the rear triangle. Oh, I see. And so I wouldn't be able to say exactly where this happens if they're just lengthening the link or an attachment for it. But yeah, that would you make still sense. have the same size rear triangle across all sizes. It's just you can lengthen the chain stay at the front triangle. Yeah. Yeah, that would make sense if you could have different linkages, which are much smaller pieces and a lot of times are machined or, you know, yeah, don't involve a mold. So mm, makes sense. But yeah, definitely worth like diving into and because there's there's more than that. Um, and I think like with geometry having changed so much in the past couple of years, I think that's probably driving it too. Mm, yeah, definitely. A lot going on in the bike world as usual in 2022. A lot of fun bikes that we were able to test this year and also a lot that we're hoping to get a leg over uh, next year. Yeah, it's time to start writing down uh, writing down tests for next year. <laughs> for sure. Well, if you missed any of the reviews of the bikes that we checked out this year, be sure to go to singletracks.com uh, where you can find all of those. And we'll have photos of these along with the transcript on the website uh, when you're hearing this episode. That's all we've got this week. We'll talk to you again next week. Bye.